I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, has there been declaration of public notice? Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, order, order of business. I don't think there's any issues regarding the order of business. Um, we have uh, four public appearances uh, tonight. Um, speakers will be asked to uh, submit their their their, um, uh, to, um, their discussions to three minutes. Um, please come up when you have a uh, when you have a comment. Take a seat here so that uh, we can pick you up on the microphone and state your name and address. Um, we'll start with Jennifer Busen. Or is it Busen? Busen. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good evening. I'm Jennifer Buston, 501 for Stage House Trail, Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I'm currently a teacher at Glacial Drumline where I teach 6th grade, 7th grade, 8th grade vocal music, and 5th grade general music. I've taught for MG my entire career and will be completing my 19th year of teaching this year. I see over 200 students a day and I have taught thousands in our district since uh, my start in the year 2000. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I do sincerely appreciate the collaborative efforts of the MGSD board. While I do not have any personal experience working for other districts, with 20 years of experience I've come to know many other education professionals in other districts and states, and I know that true collaboration and a genuine desire to create great environments for both students and teachers is not always the norm, so thank you very much. I would like to use my time this evening to address the growing concern of our salary structure. The benchmark of a 15-year teacher in Dane County is $55,000. Yet, with 19 years of experience, I fall short of that by a fair amount. I'm fully cognizant that the grass is not always greener on the other side, as they say. And I recognize that MG has a great benefits package and that there are many other positive aspects that make this the place to be. However, I do not see a path forward to raise my salary other than completing a master's degree and applying for level four. Unfortunately, that degree comes with a cost and a time requirement that is simply not in the cards for me or my family. It's disheartening to know that a teacher was recently hired with a BA and four years of experience and that they make over $3,000 a year more than me in year 19. It's disheartening to see that there is a $14,000 swing in the salary range between the lowest and the highest salary in the district just for those of us with 18 years of experience, and that for some reason I am sitting at the bottom of that cohort. And frankly, it's unacceptable that if we adjust teachers with master's degrees down by $2,000 to make a true comparison, there are 24 teachers with fewer years of experience than I who are making more and two that are making significantly greater amounts to the tune of over $10,000 a year. Look, I'm not here to talk up my own teaching prowess. I'm the last person to do that, and I'm not here to demand a raise. I get it. I love this district, and at this point, I would love to spend the rest of my career here. It would be amazing to say that I taught my entire career in one place, in one district. <laughs> and that I did it in a district that put the needs of students and staff at the top of the priority list. What I do ask you to consider is what is that going to look like for me? In the 15 to 20 years that I have left, is it acceptable to you that a teacher who has dedicated her entire career to your children, that I be left at the bottom of a salary schedule? How is it acceptable that we have no discernible career-long structure and plan that allows me to see where I'm going to be in five years, or 10 years, or 15. As I approach the end of my career, there will be new teachers coming in, and they very well could be placed at higher salary levels than I. That's a tough thing to stomach at year 19, and I can just imagine how difficult it will be at year 29. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Jennifer, could I? Jennifer. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. We, we just get to ask one question. Okay. Would you do me a favor, um, and, and I don't know how the rest of the board feels, but it's really helpful to mm -hmm. me, and I, Beth had done that for me as well. If you, if you, you have want a copy it. of that, then you would send it to and us. Do you want Whatever. the paper? Actually, I'd like, I was going to email you for a copy. Okay. I, will. So. Yeah, we I can email it out tomorrow. Just because I... Because then we can look at the so numbers. So if you want to email it, so sure. If you want to email it to the whole board? Then sure, I'm happy to. That'd be appropriate. Thank Thanks. No problem. Thank you. Um, I actually have one question. You no, mentioned um, uh, Dane County, the mm -hmm. benchmark salary. Is that including um, Madison? 
or just? Uh, I believe it is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Nope. Awesome. Thank you. All right, uh, Todd Anderson Goldsworth. Hello, my name is Todd Anderson Goldsworthy. I live at 422 Glenway Street in Madison. I'm currently in my fifth year of teaching math at the high school. First of all, I want to thank the board for giving me the chance to speak today. In my five years at MG, I have had nothing but positive experiences collaborating with the board, and I'm continually impressed with the desire the board has to take what teachers have to say to heart and to help advocate for all teachers. As I said before, I'm a math teacher, which basically means I'm a numbers guy. I'm calculated. I'm a planner. I'm not a jump head first and let it all play out kind of guy. I'm more of a plan things out and set yourself up for success kind of guy. If you don't believe me, I'll share with you a spreadsheet I used last summer for a camping road trip to plan every campsite, hike, meal, and mile traveled. <laughs> so clearly, I'm type A. I'm also young and have certain goals in life down the road like buying a house and retirement. But the way our compensation system is set up now does not provide me any comfort in knowing what the future holds for me. At the start of the next school year, I will be entering level three on our compensation plan. This is currently the only guaranteed salary increase left, and I'm only going to be in my sixth year of teaching. What will things look for, like for me in another five years, in 10 years, in 20 years? As a planner, I need details. I need to be able to see how my salary throughout my teaching career will help me accomplish the goals I have for my personal life. Our current compensation plan falls short when it comes to planning for the future and having any sort of predictability beyond the first five years of teaching. I come here to ask that as a school board, you work with teachers to help develop a clear and objective salary schedule that provides teachers insight into their salaries for the extent of their career. So many of our, so many of our comparable school districts have worked post Act 10 on developing this type of salary schedule, and I believe that Monona Grove can and should do the same. Monona Grove is home for me. It's the first and only school district I've worked in. I would like to be able to stay here for the duration of my career, continuing to connect with the students and families and the community. But without a clear idea of what the future holds, my eyes begin to wander, and I ask, what would it be like somewhere else? I have only one data point to offer up, which is ironic since I am a numbers guy. 298. 298 is the number of teachers that we currently have in the Monona Grove School District. I ask that the board work on creating a career-long salary schedule in an attempt to retain those 298 teachers who love this district and are dedicated to the students in this district. Thank you for your time and for your continued collaboration with the teachers of this great district. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Duss. Uh, Jeremy Deuce, uh, 4906 Schofield Street, Monona. Uh, good evening. Uh, my two children go to Winnequa, and I'm a teacher at Monona Grove High School, and I've been teaching English at the high school for uh, the last 12 years, and I have a total of 13 years of experience in education. Uh, I want to thank the board for allowing me to speak tonight and also for being such great advocates for our students, district parents, my own children, and for teachers over the years. It really is appreciated. Uh, as I've said, I've been a teacher in this district for 12 years, and I've seen firsthand the progress that we've all made towards building a better Monona Grove. As a teacher in the classroom, I believe I've personally made a significant positive impact on thousands of students' lives. I'm sure we have people in this room today who heard me speak as the staff speaker at graduation in 2014, an honor bestowed upon me by that graduating class. Not only have I provided classroom instruction, I've served as a pathfinder, forensics coach, track and cross country coach, and many, many other responsibilities. I was here when our department had to cut back staff uh, back in, I think it was 2008 and 2009, and my family personally felt the impact as my contract went from 1.0 to 0 0.2 in 2009. If not for the fortuitous and timely intervention from Renee Tennant in August of 2009, I may have left the district altogether. I was also a teacher during the Act 10 years, and as we all know, the impact from that legislation is still felt today. In the past few years, I have become concerned over the direction of my compensation and that of fellow colleagues with a similar experience of mine. Uh, over the past week, I've been researching my compensation in comparison to others in the district, and I found that colleagues who were hired in 2007, my cohort, have uh, somewhat similar pay, but what has me concerned 
and uh, quite frankly a little frustrated is the number of employees who have significantly less experience but make equivalent or in some cases more than I do. Uh, this is not a small number of employees and over the past decade my pay has not kept up with my years of service to MG. Um, a few notes, uh, for teachers with 12 years of experience there is an $11,000 difference from lowest to highest salary and the district employs 20 teachers with BAs who make more than I do but have fewer years of service. Uh, several teachers have eight years or fewer service years. Uh, most people here would agree that uh, $50,000 for 10 years of service would be an appropriate salary. I'm closing in on 13 years of experience and make significantly less. I'm not asking the district to match teacher salaries with the private sector because we all know that's not practical or realistic. But what I am arguing is that teachers with over 10 years of experience should be paid competitive salaries in order for the district to retain our best teachers. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of myself, but also as well as others who were hired and at the low starting salary. Uh, several years after I was hired, the district raised the starting teacher salaries, but the difference has not been adequately raised for those who were hired before the increase. For those of us in that situation, um, I would say those of us hired before 2009, we feel that the district has forgotten about our efforts on behalf of our students and community. Um, I understand there's no easy solution to this, and I'm not the only teacher in the district who has over 10 years of experience, yet has a salary that is often matched and sometimes surpassed by those with less time at Monona Grove. Uh, many, is, uh, many of us have stuck with the district through difficult, challenging times. We, we remember those years. And we feel that we should be compensated for our hard work, our dedication to the district, commitment to the district, and our students. Um, I'm mid-career at this point. I have maybe 15 to 20 years left teaching at Monona Grove. I'd hope that the district would make an effort to fairly compensate uh, me and others in my cohort for the second half of our careers. We appreciate your continued support, and I hope that we can all work together and make certain that MG remains a district of choice for educators in Wisconsin. Thank, Thank you. you. Any questions? <coughs> and uh, last we have Sarah Falberg. Uh, hello, I'm Sarah Falberg. I live at 4705 Schofield Street, Monona. Uh, I am a senior this year at Monona Grove High School, and thank you all so much for giving me the chance to speak here. Uh, I really value government um, and, in general, the work of public service. Uh, and two weeks ago, I attended my first school board meeting and realized that I was missing a lot of what you all are doing behind the scenes that um, we don't see as students at school. So I've become interested in potentially a advisory student representative on the school board um, to be a voice for the students at Monona Grove and our district in, in general, and to serve as a connection between the school, the students, uh, and the school board. Um, two weeks ago when I attended, I really had no idea what was going on in this room, but there were a lot of things that I could connect to uh, that were going on, like the schedule changes, um, there were announcements that related to what was going on right around me. Uh, and I think that this role would be important in allowing the students to know more about what's going on here and that affects them, um, and also to be a voice in this room for the students at the school. Uh, so I've set up a meeting next week with Superintendent uh, Dan Olson, thank you for doing that, uh, to look into this idea possibly more. And if you're interested in talking about it, um, I'd be interested in hearing your ideas. So thank you all. Have you a question? Have you looked into other school districts in the state that are doing that? Yeah, so I've talked to... What did um, you learn? I talked to some students. Uh, Madison has a very established uh, student representative. They have a student senate and a student representative on the school board. Middleton got their first uh, student representative on the school board recently, too, and um, it seems to be an overall effective way of getting involved, the students involved in government or in the school board. We, we actually do have a policy that would permit a student representative, and we had one a number of years ago, and we retained that policy. We just haven't had interest, so that's okay. nice. Cool that you're interested in it. We can have you follow. Uh, no, we're just no, trying, I'm to trying to look it up. I'm looking it up, but I'm not finding <laughs> it. Right. And I, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, so don't feel like you have to you know. Um, do you see this as an elected position or like an appointed position that's appointed? To uh, that's something I was considering. Um, I think. What would make sense is for 
students to elect each other because it gives a sort of importance to the position rather than it being appointed where you have to apply. Um, so, but I haven't fully considered it in that I, I was thinking about that the other day about which would be the best option and still think about that. So is that something you would like to do? Yeah, and I've talked to a couple okay. of your students as well. <coughs> oh, you mean serve in this role? Yeah. Potentially, but I'm a senior, so. I know, so we're running out of time. Yeah, I know. No, 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 no. I'm looking to, like, make it more of an established role in our school. She could stay at the high school another year. <laughs> Super senior. Um, and it used to be 441.2. So, effectively, um, when someone speaks the governance rules are we aren't really allowed to discuss it. So if when I but I'm allowed to ask you questions. So if the question seems a little weird, it's to generate that piece from you if I can. Um, Susan indicated we have a policy. Have you so uh, one of the things that governs what we do and the membership in the school board is board policy. Have you reviewed board policy? I haven't to look for that. Really okay, so put that on your to-do list. Um, and Susan is chair of the policy committee, so it might be helpful to discuss that with her when we okay. get done. Um, if you wanted to do that, oh, it's in the question mark at the end. Um, and that, uh, if you have a board policy. That will give you direction on how to proceed with that. If it's not exactly what you have on your mind and how you'd like to do that, um, you can talk to the chair of policy in terms of making a change to the policy and using direction. Have you talked to anybody at the high school about your interest in being I've, a board member? I've talked to, uh, of my personal interest, I haven't talked about that. Um, I've talked to a couple students who expressed an interest in at least having somebody on the school board, and uh, one of the things I'd be interested in doing is potentially surveying the students to see if this is a role that they would find helpful or be interested in. So that was kind of my question, um, and I don't know what the policy is, but my question to you is if, um, would you be interested uh, in helping set this up for the next year mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so that if whether it would be election or appointed position in working on that to make sure that it's set up yeah i would like to help make sure that this continues in future years okay thank you if you'd like to just send me an email okay. i will find you the policy and send it to you that'd be great and thank it's you. on the board, board okay. website Sounds thanks good. thank you Thank you. Actually, I'm looking at it. it. looks like we used to have a policy. Yeah, we, we still have one. We have still have one that allows Well, that's not for us. Thank you. We'll look into that. Thank, Thank you. you very much. It's not very helpful as far as how it's, yeah. you know, what it says, but we have one. Maybe All right. Uh, one. Next is the consent, consent agenda. Uh, I'd like a motion for approval of the consent agenda as presented. Motion approved. Second. Motion to approve. Second. Okay. <coughs> um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Uh, recognition, Stan. Okay, so I'd like to begin with recognizing uh, four teachers who will be retiring at the end of this school year. Uh, those four uh, retirements were just part of the consent agenda that was just approved. Brian Henry has just, uh, is it in his 30th year as an educator, all 30 years at Nona Grove uh, School District. Michelle Lammers, Lambert, excuse me, 29 years as an educator, the last two here at, at, um, in our district. Pete Landry, 32 years as an educator, 19 with the Nona Grove School District. And Denise Meyer, 27 years as an educator, 19 here in the district. So congratulations uh, to all four of those individuals and we certainly wish them the best moving on uh, a few months from now. Um, student recognition. Um, Sonia Samea, a senior at uh, high school, won the Voice of Democracy Scholarship <coughs> at the BFW Post 7591 on Cosgrove Road with an amazing speech about why my vote matters. And there's some information to link to some pictures and detail um, on your board docs. Um, 
Three of our staff members, our instructional coaches slash uh, TOSAs, John Hagen, Kate Kelly Vetter, and Nicole North Hester recently presented at the Middleton Area Cross Plains School District Winter Institute, sharing about all the great work going on in our school district. Winter Institute brings together hundreds of educators from around Wisconsin. Uh, Mr. Hagen, Ms. Vetter, and Ms. North Hester presented on best practices to improve instructional planning. Boy swim team uh, recently took second place at the state swim meet and earned the fire truck ride up the drive to the high school to welcome them home. Uh, photos of the meet and so on are also included on your board docs. And lastly, uh, high school sophomore Camille Simmons was chosen as a finalist in the highly competitive Midwest Entrepreneurship Pitch Competition at UW Whitewater. Thrilled to have her represent our school district at this regional competition that took place uh, recently. Um, actually, we just got word late this afternoon that Camille placed second in the competition. So, congratulations, Camille. Okay. Correspondence and announcements. Um, all right, then we're ready to move to uh, our facilities update um, with uh, <coughs> just, just uh, Epstein, you, you and the architect. Talk about the process. Okay. We'll give it a sore roll. We'll see how it works. Good evening again, Bob Biger from Epstein Architects. Uh, we're excited to be here tonight. I also have Megan Walker, a senior interior designer, working on your project as well. Um, we've got an update for you relative to where we are in the process. Um, talk a little bit about schedule, and then we want to talk a little bit about the design process that we've been going through over the last few months. If you remember the first time I was here, about a month or so ago, I think it's been now, um, we talked about kind of the entire design process and where we were at this particular time. If you remember, we have schematic design, which was where we had just started. We are still in schematic design. Um, although within the next month we'll be moving into design development. Again, design development is kind of adding a little bit more detail to it. The schematic design is more where are the spaces going, what does the building start to look like from uh, a concept standpoint. So the schematic design, like I had talked about, we've got the core team, we've gone through a visionary team process, and we've got some of those members here this evening that are going to talk about that particular process. Um, basically what comes out of that is a design concept that again helps us look at the organizational structure inside the building and the aesthetic qualities of the building both exterior and interior. As far as schedule, I'll talk about the new building first. Um, again, in schematic design, we'll be finishing that up at the end of March and moving into design development. And again, that process is where we start to add more detail. And if you think about a, a room in design development, we may be talking about what type of casework goes in that room. And then once we get to construction documents, that's when we start to actually dimension that casework or that particular room. Then we'll, we will be bidding that out with Findor in November through March, where the scoping will occur, and construction would start April of 20. And then school is opening again September of 21, 2021. Relative to the renovations, these are a little bit different um, as far as how they are working in time frame. Um, we are kind of in general, I would say, working through schematic design on all of them right now. And uh, design development would be April through June. And then the construction documents will be a little bit earlier than the new building. However, um, none of that construction work, I shouldn't say none, I'll get to that in a second, isn't going to happen this summer. Most of that work will happen this summer of 20 and 21. So 2020, 2020 and 2021, most of the work. There is some work happening this summer, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So you'll see the construction. We've got some summer work of 19, 20, 20. With the visionary team update, we've had four visionary team meetings and we'll go through what those were in a moment. Um, that team also toured a couple of different schools in the area, in Sun Prairie and in Wanakee, to kind of give them an idea of what modern learning environments look like, um, and really see those spaces and how they were being utilized by uh, staff and, and students. Through that process, that's when we start to generate those concept ideas. How are those spaces organized? How are they coming together? Big picture ideas. 
with the existing buildings, we've gone through and we've talked with all the principals at this point. So we're really narrowing down the spaces that we're working on and what we're doing in those. If you remember during early planning, we had those floor plans that had, there were some orange boxes, some blue and some light blue, dark blue and light blue boxes that were showing renovation. We've had meetings with the principals now where we're getting into what we're doing within those spaces. So we're narrowing down the scope. I talked about the summer work. There is summer work happening at MG21. I've listed Glacial Drumlin, let me talk about that in a second. And we also have some summer work happening at Winnequa, specifically related to the water issue in the, the, um, the music room. The work for Glacial Drumlin, we had anticipated just removing the stage and infilling that wall, kind of the, the back wall of the stage. After we've done some planning and looking at both capacity and how the serving lines are working there, we're going to hold off on doing that work so that we don't build something and regret it down the road. There's some additional planning that we're going through looking at capacity in those serving lines, and we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. So that work we've decided actually just yesterday to hold off on that and start that work that would be work then of 2020, not 2021. Um, through that entire process, uh, Katie has been working on getting information out uh, to the community as well related to the design process. Obviously, we don't have construction updates yet, but that will be coming out as well. So I'm going to have Megan talk about our process relative to the visionary team and what that looks like. And then the visionary team is going to talk about some guiding principles that came out of that. So the visionary team was created by um, the, the district, and it was a group of teachers that were kind of on the forefront of education, who are willing to push the boundaries, who are forward thinkers. Um, and it was a really great group of teachers and staff from both Glacial Drumlin and Cottage Grove. We had representatives um, from specialty departments as well as third, fourth, and fifth grade teachers. And we met with them over a series of four, and we call them workshops. So they were these working sessions where we were actively working together. The very first workshop was similar to what you see right up here on the board. Actually, I think this is probably from that first workshop. We had a bunch of images laid out, and we asked the teachers to select an image that would help, or that would guide us to help us understand who Monona Grove School District is. Um, and so as the teachers took those images and described them, described their vision for the future spaces, um, these, we took those words and kind of developed them into a set of five different guiding principles. And these guiding principles were really one of the main outcomes from these visionary sessions. The guiding principles are used to help steer the design of both the renovation work and the new construction so that we'll have some cohesion in that work. Um, and then also, we use those kind of as a, as a metric throughout the process to make sure that we're still on track with what we set day one. We make sure that in the end, when it's being constructed, that the design and the actual buildings are still aligning with these guiding principles that we're, we set out to do. So these are kind of our goals for the project. Um, and the teachers are really um, crucial in establishing that. So I'm going to let them talk through what those guiding principles are, because these were really teacher-led. So. Hi, I'm Tiffany Haas in fourth grade at Cottage Grove School. And our first guiding principle was community. And if you just look at the last sentence even, because you don't have to read the whole thing, just look at the last sentence on there. It says, design spaces to promote collaboration and foster relationships. And that right there spoke to me because it directly relates to our first non-negotiable as a district, that every employee shares the responsibility for the, the, for the prevention of student failure. And um, so we all care for the su success and community and development of each learner and member of our community. And in order to do that, we have to create spaces that will promote a community. So we need flexible spaces that will allow all, develop, all to develop and make connections. And we're not talking about just relationships with <coughs> students, but relationships from <coughs> staff members to staff members across grade levels and any subject area. Um, creating a community brings a feeling of fellowship with each other too. And students and staff know that they're loved and belonged, and then they are able to take risks um, and collaborate with each other. Hi, I'm Abby Dilcher. I'm also a fourth grade teacher at Cottage Grove. Um, so this word flexibility really resonated with us when we, um, throughout this planning process, um, you know, design with the future in mind, prioritizing flexibility to accommodate growth and change. Um, architecturally, we envisioned a building that would um, adapt and grow with us um, well into the future. 
um, you know, walls that could be brought down if needed um, to collaborate, uh, not only with um, other staff members, but students, um, at just places that kids can get together to learn. Um, the flexibility to make any room really into a learning space. Um, and more importantly, we really th um, thought about our students when it came to flexibility um, and empowering our students and giving them the, vo the voice and choice um, and really take ownership of their learning. Um, we were really talking and we just thought about like how neat that is that any student who walks into our building, um, we can fit to their needs um, throughout this process. So flexibility was one that really stood out to us. Hi, I'm Erin Reagan. I'm one of the reading specialists at um, Cottage Grove and I've um, been teaching for 14 years so I've had time to be a reading specialist and a classroom teacher so I've had a unique lens in this process but um, Opportunity was our third guiding principle that we came up with and when we thought about Opportunity we that meant in the learning spaces in the new building would be able to give all learners all opportunities to learn in ways that's best for them so we wanted those learning spaces to really be something that, um, like Abby was saying, is collaboration spaces for students, for teachers. Um, we want those spaces, as you can see in that middle picture there, for kids to be doing some hands-on activities. We want them to be able to be explorers. We want them to be curious, have the opportunity to solve those, figure out those <coughs> answers to those questions, solve those problems. And we want them to make sure that they're comfortable in those spaces. So a building that offers opportunity for all our learners was important to us. Hi, Nancy Castillo, third grade at Cottage Grove School. Um, I, we seek to empower students, so to help them find their voices as teachers, um, help them discover the power that lies within them. So. Um, that's a huge guiding principle as a teacher, and also that they come as they are. You're welcome as who you are, so very welcoming environment um, where we're all just learning from each other. Um, empower mean, means that we're guiding students to discover their own power in their learning and self-regulating in all aspects of their life. So moving education from compliance, um, now we're more focusing on engagement but now the next step is then empowering. And that becomes a shift from giving choices to inspiring possibilities. It's a shift from making the subject interesting to tapping into their student interests and incorporating that. It's a shift from a rigid structure to adjustable systems. Um, and students own that process. And that shift from compliance to that self-directed mindset, um, student ownership and self-regulation. We want to foster problem solvers, not answer givers, um, students who seek to understand. And finally, we want students to be able to share their stories and their truths and feel safe in doing so. And then that leads me to the next slide, <laughs> which is wellness and refuge. Um, we've all experienced the difference between walking into different places, places that make you go, ugh, and some that make you say, wow. And based on design and fit with our community, um, aesthetically, people and students want to be in this building that they have designed. Um, and based on all the previous principles discussed, once they're in here, they'll want to stay and learn in here, and they won't. They'll want to be where they are, a place where they can truly be themselves and be in the driver's seat on their learning journey, um, a place that's safe for them. The community can community can trust their students, their, their, their world with us, um, and not only physically, but emotional safety for all the students. And whoever walks through the door, whoever has a place. So those guiding principles um, really guide what we do. So after those visionary meetings and coming up with those guiding principles, we take those ideas and we start to look at those spaces within the building and, and really apply those guiding principles to it. Um, through the course of that, our team goes back and really takes those spaces, all, all the spaces that are in your buildings and, and spaces maybe that you don't have currently, and look at how they go together. We bring those back to the visionary team, get additional feedback based on, you know, they, they actually looked at things that we were doing and said, hey, wait a second, let's review our guiding principles and make sure that these plans, these ideas fit. And um, 
we got to a point and they felt like they really fit. So I'm really excited about where we are. We, we don't have a building designed yet. We're still working on that. Um, it's a work in progress. So we do have a ways to go. Um, but really, the process that we've been going through with the visionary team and, and getting the guiding principles has been wonderful. And I think at the end of the day, whatever we come up with um, is going to hold true to all those guiding principles. I don't know if you have any questions on that. Otherwise, I can go into the next steps. Do you want me to just do that? Anybody have questions? I, I have one. I'm glad somebody's doing the, the visionary part of it. Uh, over the years, uh, I grew up teaching in a high school that we built a uh, 2,500 pupil high school every year for six years. That's how fast it was growing. Uh, the biggest mistakes that I've seen as a, as a professor out in the field too is the size of the rooms. We have that, some of that problem in, in Monona Grove too. And it seems to me that uh, however you shape the spaces, the glass, the re is that the number of square feet has a lot to do with what you can do and, um, and what you can do with the next generation. And that sort of thing. Are you looking at something like 900 square feet or 700 square feet or some variation? Or, or are you going beyond uh, rectangular spaces? and open spaces, as I remember some of those, I, I hate to be negative on it, but what the thing I saw was a huge room in Denver, once a school that had 1,300 kids in a middle school, all under one roof with no walls. And uh, what the teachers did is that they ended up building walls with bookcases and everything like that, that uh, because somebody needs to call it home and we need to have some boundaries of what's our house and what's somebody else's house. Just tell me about some of the basics because, uh, sure. uh, and rather than carry me along at architectural uh, dreams. That's a great question. So, you know, what does the learning space I thought it like? was too, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, one of the guiding principles talked about um, being able to accommodate everyone. And not everyone performs well in a huge group of people. So within the, the spaces that we are creating, there's what I'll call a legacy size classroom, if you will. But we also have smaller breakout learning spaces. Within those legacy classrooms, however, they can be opened up into larger spaces as well if you wanted to bring more students together. So within the spaces that we're designing, there are different sized areas. Another component that's completely different um, from some of the schools theme that you probably were in was the furniture um, and how furniture is utilized to really shape what happens within the room. You know, if you think about a room that's got 30 desks in it and how they organize them, yeah, you can move them around, but it's really inflexible. There's new furniture that allows for small groups to get together that are much easier to, to have those small group conversations. So we look at the room really as a function of what's happening within it. The furniture helps provide that, along with those other you know, smaller size learning spaces, or where we can expand it into something larger. I don't know, Megan, do you have any other Yeah, thoughts? I would just say, um, you know, that legacy classroom, we're, we're aiming for 850-900 square feet. They won't all be exactly that, but that's kind of what we're looking at. But there are also a lot of auxiliary spaces that I think a lot of the existing um, schools don't have. And these auxiliary spaces allow learning to go beyond the classroom, where there's still a visual connection, where there's the ability, the adaptability to open and, and have kind of a larger learning space or kind of smaller, more intimate learning spaces. I don't know if any of you, you guys have, do you guys want to speak to any of that? I think you did a good yeah. job. <laughs> Dean, we don't need to fit the advocates in anymore. <laughs> I didn't hear you. So we don't need to fit the abacus in anymore, so we, we can have a little more flexibility. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So next steps for us as far as the design and construction team, we are continuing through schematic design. As I had mentioned, we'll finish that up uh, towards the end of March. Um, after that process, uh, Findorf will look at budgeting as far as where we are. And if we need to make adjustments, we'll make adjustments. That's not to say that this is the only time that they're looking at budget. Um, we're on the phone with Peter uh, quite often from Findorf, just sharing ideas about what we're doing, what they have in their budget. So there's a collaborative effort going on uh, 
related to budget. Um, and then also the other meetings with staff that will start to occur. We, like I mentioned, we're meeting with the principals currently. We'll start meeting with some of those other staff members that are part of those spaces. And then within the next probably month, we'll start meeting with uh, other staff related to the new building as well. Um, one of the comments I think Megan had talked about was the guiding principles aren't just for the, the new building, it's for the renovation projects as well. So for instance, we've got a library that will be going into the new building. We're looking at doing a library renovation at Winnequa. The concepts that we're looking at for a library, we want to overlay at both of those schools. Now, we understand that the Winnequa library space is already built, but whatever we want to do from a programmatic standpoint, we want to overlay that into Winnequa the best that we can. So we don't want to get too far ahead with some of those projects. And as I mentioned, that's why they're, they're kind of um, somewhat uh, lagging behind, perhaps, the new building. And some of the renovation may be a little bit ahead. We want to make sure that we're overlapping those concept, concepts. So um, those staff meetings are part of that. And then there are some district updates as well. I don't know if Dan or Katie want to talk about these. Sure. Go ahead. Um, it's nothing that you don't know about already. So the um, ongoing design and construction updates, one will go out tomorrow morning um, with some of the same information you heard tonight. That goes to anyone who signed up for our e-newsletter. It goes to all families in the district and to our staff as well. Um, we're hosting a series of staff listening sessions. Staff will um, be, will we'll come to them in their buildings give updates, um, share any information that's relevant to those buildings, but also an all-district update as well. And then um, we'll host a community update in April. We'll do that in person and then live stream and record that as well for anyone who can't make it. That's all I have. Okay. Questions? Well, I have one. I really love uh, guiding principles approach. Um, but I'm going to suggest, when I look at this project, an additional guiding principle. Um, that is, uh, because when I look at this project, there's something else which, you know, which I'm looking at. We heard teachers come today and say that, um, you know, we're, we, we have issues with salaries, which we do. And I'd love to get, have more money to put in the pockets, the pockets of teachers. Our maintenance operation expenses come from our uh, operating budget, as do our teacher salaries. <coughs> One of the and which and the operating budget is cap is cap. When we can move operating expenses such as our power bills and maintenance and so on out of our operating budget, and we can do it with capital budget, for example, we can we can do things in capital budget that lower our costs in the operating budget. It frees up our ability. It frees up money that we can use to pay teachers. We'd love to be able to do that. Um, we are, in terms of, um, when I started on this board in 2007, we were actually the highest district in the state per pupil energy cost. We have made substantial strides on that, but we're still substantially above average. So what I would like to suggest is that we add another guiding principle around sustainability. The idea being that we have this opportunity and now we want to look at this design from the point of view of the long-term cost of operation both for staffing for maintenance and for operating expenses like power um, i also think that if we look at efficient energy uses and alternative energy uses it's just something that would speak to students young people today and i would suggest very strongly that we add a fifth guiding principle or i'm sorry sixth guiding principle which is just which is sustainability <laughs> I think it's a very important criteria, and I think every decision we're making, we should be looking at that. Because it has so much payback down the road, and we have a history of not looking at that and ending up with expensive buildings, that is, buildings that are extensive, expensive to operate. Not anybody's fault, it wasn't anybody's first, you know, back then when some of these buildings were built, it wasn't anybody's first order of business. But it should be, I think, equal to all of those today, because it's important for us to help um, to help manage this district going forward in the, in, the th in the future and to help be able to pay teachers and to do what we want educationally, free up money to do, it, do, do what we want educationally. Uh, that's just important that's happening in this building. And anybody, oh, well, hang on a second.
second, I want to see if, this is my question for other folks, I want to see if you have any feedback response to that comment. I, I apologize. So that last um, guiding principle, the wellness and refuge, um, mm -hmm. I should have mentioned the sustainability was our goal in that, that guiding principle too. So as we looked at the schools, we looked at natural lighting and um, those sorts of things. Yeah, wellness of the occupants and um, that was part of, I think it was encompassed in there, it maybe didn't say it clearly, mm -hmm. um, but we could maybe reword that if, or if we should strongly. I, 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 my opinion is that it should be a stronger, that should be a, this should be an explicit statement um, because, like I said, going forward it's an extremely important um, um, piece of the puzzle. Susan? Yep. Actually, we have done that, and we did that um, in a fairly massive scale. I'm not sure our success was great, but we did do it, and we have cared about that. And I would say during the 10 years that Peter and I have been on the board, the focus clearly has been very strong in strong board support um, for, again, the sustainability issue. And I could hear that, but I agree that that should be a focus. We actually had a particular company that came in and did significant revisions, comes back and reports every year. And it's it's not just the savings, but it's, again, making things better for the environment and um, kind of that global picture on the wellness piece. Um, and again, I really appreciate that you're looking at that wellness and <coughs> culture and feel, because it's so important, the research is so clear on if a child is comfortable in that, in that room, in that building, it dramatically increases their ability to learn and to connect. I, I, I just think it's wonderful having you guys here to have input. I'd like to second that too, because it, it would seem to me that uh, what we're talking about on the energy sustainability and that sort of thing will in in fact uh, increase our ability to uh, take the money out of operating cost and uh, put it in the capital cost and that will help us. Um, if I could just add that we, for your question that you guys brought up about sustainability, when we toured the Wanaki and some very schools, which you guys were part of, um, and Findorf was there, both of them, and Findorf was there with us, it was highlighted throughout the school about sustainability, not only educating um, the students, but the community, like they had it all over the walls and everything. So I know that that is definitely, you guys have already been doing it, it's definitely gonna be in this plan, so maybe just changing a wording just so it's more clear to everybody. But just so you do know, like it is very obvious with what we got to see in our tours, that it is definitely a highlight. would help to have big letters on a PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just from the perspective, we spend six hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year on electricity. Correct, Jared? Um, that's a that's a lot of money. Um, Oregon is in the middle of building a net zero um, elementary school, which means their electric bill for that school should be zero if they do it right on average. Um, and I hate being shown up by Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think this, you know, motivation. I think and there's. And the other thing is there's money to help us do things um, available. The governor's talking about uh, bringing back some of this uh, renewable um, uh, support for it in his, in his budget. And um, there's also private funds out there available, that's available. And we should take advantage of those to the max. Anything that helps us reduce our operating costs, we want to take advantage of that. I think, to the max. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for participating. Yeah, uh, just, just to know for the uh, board members, there's, there's also just our facilities update later. So if we want to, on the, on the agenda, if we want to have a discussion amongst ourselves instead of with all these folks waiting around for us to argue over things, we can, we will we'll have, we have an opportunity to do that. Thanks again for posting the PowerPoint. I, I'm telling you, I look. Thank you guys for coming. Thank, thank you for the work you've done so far.
status report. Yeah. Okay, I have three items. Um, I won't speak in detail unless I have questions. If you have questions, I can talk a little bit more about it. But just uh, first of all, the MG21 um, expansion update. So regularly meeting with um, folks on MG21 in the planning part of that. Um, and we just recently had the deadline, the initial deadline for applications to the uh, middle level through grade 6 through 8. And as of February 15th of the deadline, there are 20 applications students in grades 6 through 8. Um, we actually, after the deadline, have received a couple more and probably will continue to, but for those 20 initially that met the deadline with the initial focus, and certainly we'll consider uh, applicants after that as well as long as there is space and, and there is. So uh, we're going to be talking about the staffing plan a little bit later here in the board agenda. We'll talk about where that fits into the MG21 planning, but very pleased with that initial response. And, and so everything has gone very well in that planning piece. <coughs> Um, and then with regard to the facilities part of that, that will become upcoming as well um, in future board meeting where you'll see what uh, they've been working on. Uh, Northwestern Mendel uh, applications uh, recently uh, were due and uh, so we received a total of 18 applications uh, for those five spots that we have yeah. annually for five-year-old kindergarten. Um, and just as a reminder, I did attach the application process as, as well um, in case anyone had any questions on, on that piece. So. And parents were recently notified, uh, if you recall, it's a random selection, and so uh, the five uh, that were chosen were notified, as well as everyone else, and that are on the waiting list. So, Chris? Uh, how long have we been with that Nuestro Mundo? Is this fourth year? No, it's I believe this is year six. 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 Yeah. 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 Have we ever... Uh, communicated with the parents who have had kids in that program and have you met with them or asked them to fill out an evaluation for it seems like it has a good reputation mm -hmm. and uh, but it would be good to get some feedback I We've think had anecdotal feedback nothing formal like that I'm suggesting formal yeah. Susan so you maybe you want to expand on why. So basically, this is a program. It's a Madison School District program. It's a school, actually. Charter yeah. school. Right? Yeah. And we, through our relationship in the rental agreement, which was really great, the work that was on that rental agreement was great, we are offered five <coughs> positions. I know all that, Susan. Okay. So I appreciate that. So, um, what would our role be in evaluating or getting feedback on how they feel about that school and program? Well, they may have already done it. Western Mundo may have their own evaluations of it. If they have, it would be interesting to learn of our, of our district's uh, participation in it and to know something of the success of it, it seems to me. It, Probably has been a success, but oh, again, I'm sure that's documented in the, the Madison School District. If, if I would, I mean, if I would comment, the um, five spots. What is it? Is it three free? Five, two five open enrollment, or um, how does it? Maybe work? it's two. I, I forget yeah. what it, it actually. Just, it sort of doesn't matter. But that is part of the con. That is part right. of the agreement we have with um, Madison. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it is. It is, in a sense, is there's this joint, a little bit of a joint venture nest, is it part of it, because there's five more students in there. Um, this is, and whether we want, to, what we want to do with those five slots relative to the contract should be considered part of the, in, in the contract negotiation. So I see, I understand having an information about how that is going, it may affect, it may impact what our decision making process with the contract. So I, I agree with you, but I'm, but since we just signed an agreement, right, um, right. we would have a few years before that would become relevant to anything that we any action we could take. Yeah. And just to clarify, actually, uh, this is actually year seven. It's we year the seven. initial that's contract, the six-year contract, and we just that's entered six, into yeah. new one. So that's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was multiple three. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't remember it. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't yeah. realize that requesting information would be such a controversy. <laughs> I don't know that it's controversial. I think the no. point is that it's it's parents electing to send their children to a 
open and roll them into a charter school, essentially, is what it is. And like, in other words, some of our kids may go to, our district residents may go to Edgewood or may go to different schools. There's technically no difference, um, except that, I mean, it would be, it, if we want to, if we're interested in the concept, we want to hear, because we have had this conversation before, so parents are under no obligation to tell us what their success is. I assume it's popular because we get about the same number of applications every year and we have no trouble filling them. We, we could use more slots, but they don't really want to give us any more slots because they have a waiting list of their own in Madison. So it is a, it's unique. I mean, it's really, it's only relationship to us is that it's located in Monona and we rent the space to them. So, in, in a, you know, in that way. And it was kind of a, no, a gift to us that we get, were able to they, get that part in the contract. So to that extent, there's a relationship, which makes it a little different, but well, from the view of the parents sending their kids there, it's they, not. They educate, so. what, 25 of our students, is that right? Uh, five from grade. Uh, 30, well, 30, K, I'm sorry, yeah, 30 K, 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 so they, they educate 30 of our students. Right, but there could be other schools that do as well. That's all I'm saying. Sure. I'm saying philosophically it's not different than another charter school. So no. The one piece I'll add that, that as far as communication with parents that we've tried to do a better job of is to make sure that they understand when they're applying or after they've been offered a seat that we do not have a dual immersion option in our school district. So after grade five, um, if they come back into the district, um, you know, that's not an option for them. And so we do have some parents and families that have chosen to open and roll out at that point and, and others not. But that was one thing we worked hard to make sure we communicate that clearly so there's mm -hmm. no misunderstanding. We did have that a couple of years ago. Sure. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, last thing, um, I, I just put the link to uh, the program of the conference that I recently attended and so um, I won't go through in, in detail every session, but um, not unlike the, the State of uh, the School Board Convention, as well as some of our state association things, um, focus on equity was, was really the theme of, of the conference. And so um, I'll just mention one particular session that, that is very relevant to the work that we've been doing in the district. We've had a lot of discussion about with staffing and hiring for diversity and how that might fit into a smaller district like us um, compared to a larger district like the MMSD, who has a much larger, you know, more resources and so on. And so um, I really pleased at one of the sessions I went to that was uh, Highline School District, um, suburb of Seattle. And they went through their whole process and they have a size district similar to Madison, HR department of 27 people, six full-time recruiters, and, and it's obviously a very different situation than ours, but very fit similar to Madison. And they get to the end of the presentation and they talked about then where this process came from, the consultant they used, Turns out they prop, they partnered with MMSD. Um, so I got a chance to talk to the HR director a little bit afterwards, a little bit about that process, and um, and you know what and how there's some things perhaps we can learn in our smaller district, and, and so I have some resources and context that I can make you know as a follow up. So more to come on that, but uh, that alone to me all of a sudden made it feel like worthwhile that I went to the conference. Um, and uh, um, again, we know it's such a uh, an area we've talked about also sort of challenging, you know, area to address, so. Um, but if you do have to click on the link and, and if you have any questions about any piece, I'll be glad to have any follow-up with anyone. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, on to discussion items. Uh, I'm sorry, on to board reports. Um, personnel committee, Dean. Yes, I passed out the copy of the draft minutes. The minutes have not been reviewed and approved, but they, based on the uh, committee meeting uh, earlier this week, and uh, they're there for your examination. We have more to do. <laughs> okay. Questions? <coughs> Policy committee? Susan? All right, and the Policy Committee report was added um, this afternoon, actually, you know. Which is by mistake, that's who she had the time. And I found it, you just was on it. See, I forgot to give it to you, I didn't get it. So, um, <laughs> so we, we met on February 20th, reviewed and approved with a few minor amendments to the remaining policies in the NEOLA update, NEOLA update from January of this year, um, and they're on tonight's agenda for first reading. We do have the next update that we'll be tackling at our next meeting. But 
Um, the committee also reviewed and discussed policy 7440.01, video surveillance and electronic monitoring, um, because this came up during a discussion about something else um, in the board, and uh, a board member suggest, you know, had sent us all an email asking that this be reviewed, and it looked like an easy enough one to review that I just tacked it on to the end of the agenda. We did get time to it, <clears throat> so we reviewed the policy. What, what you see in the committee report is the highlighted policy, and I typed it in blue so that um, the existing policy is in blue, and the red is the was the proposed changes. And then underneath it are the committee comments that we we ultimately decided that we didn't feel we should do anything with this policy because we felt the first request to add the words the Board of Education add, add the words reserves the right to authorize was really not necessary because it already says that it. The, the basically, the board already is the one who authorizes the use and has to authorize it. So we already have that right, so we didn't think this added anything. We already have the authorized, the authority not to authorize if we choose not to. In other words, it works both ways. And then the second request was to add the words with the input from the board so that, so that it would read the superintendent, comma, with input from the board is responsible for, for determining where to install and operate fixed location video surveillance monitoring. Um, we felt that as board members, really that belonged to the superintendent and wherever the word superintendent appears in policy it's superintendent or designate so it would be in this case obviously the superintendent along with the building principals and facilities supervisor are in the best position to determine location of camera cameras the policy already restricts usage and location of cameras in schools and on buses um, to common areas hallways that kind of thing so there's already quite a bit of restriction and I um, I did again. You want to hand that down? We we do have you do have the policy printed um, here as well, or linked here. So if anyone, um, wait, so that you could review it. It's not on the board for discussion tonight, but if you um, if you do review it, you'll find that um, the two things I pointed out are in the first two paragraphs. The third paragraph expressly says that the board will not use video surveillance monitoring to obtain information for the purpose of routine staff appraisal or evaluation or monitoring. Um, legible and visible, the fifth paragraph, legible and visible signs shall be placed at the main entrance to notify people. In addition, the district notifies parents through the handbook or other methods annually that, of the existence of these cameras. Six, any information obtained from video surveillance and monitoring items may only be used to support the orderly operations of schools, districts, districts and schools and facilities and for law enforcement purposes and not for any other purposes and as such um, they may be the, those for how they can be used then it says paragraph seven recordings of students will be treated as confidential and it goes through the federal laws regarding that so we felt there were enough um, protections and limitations already in there um, the recent Madison situation would be an example of how uh, video surveillance can be used to protect the student as well as staff. So that that was the point they are in hallways and common areas and on buses. And we've had, you know, we've had some re requests from parents in the past to have more of them in those areas. So anyway, <coughs> that's why we decided to do nothing with it. So if there's some disagreement, it would be talking with the board president and the board to see if we wanted to take this up again. Otherwise, I'm not going to talk about the other policies because the ones we finished are on tonight's agenda for first reading. So I'll talk about those more when we get to them. Has a question. I just want to say the recent Madison situation is an absolutely not a good example because you're only going to get the very, very end of the whole incident. So you're going to miss 95% of what actually happened. You're just going to see from a distance a hawk him. So it's really not, it, it's, it's a terrible You do example. get something. They, you, well, you get nothing something, but you really it. get nothing. I mean, you get you get something by... I've not seen the video, so I guess I can't comment. But I, I guess just it seems to be common sense that it's worth having. That's, that's my own opinion. As well, right, it's your opinion. But yeah. right. So did we ever actually authorize use of cameras? Did we take a vote and authorize it? We, we did we didn't, in the sense then, of the then, budget. I mean, I remember a budget proposal that included purchase of additional cameras that we approved. On the policy authorizes. The, po the policy oh, yeah, right. the policy authorizes. So you're right. We'd have to vote every year, every time they wanted a new camera. And I guess personally, well, not only personally, in the committee, we didn't feel. We felt, in other words, that the board, because we approved this policy authorizing the use of cameras, we are approving it. We didn't, as a committee, feel we wanted to do that every year. And that's why I'm saying, 
if there are additional concerns from other board members and you feel that this should be a bigger discussion, then the request should be made to put it on a board agenda um, to give direction to the policy committee because otherwise um, that was all the direction we had and that was our discussion at the time. Um, yeah, go ahead. And we will have future agenda items tonight, or you know, so you could put that request in, or somebody else could if they we could do our usual process. Of, does the rest of the board feel they want to talk about it? Authorizes the use. This kind of I mean, it does essentially the, the policy itself authorizes use. Uh, we've been as ground, you know, just simply approving a budget item does not authorize it. Well, right, um, but, but it can't be. And that's the policy itself authorizes. Right? Yeah, but the policy it itself uh, is it does not. It does in fact authorize that, presumably consistent with the with the use. Um, you know, uh, I do you know believe that the superintendent and um, this, the superintendent and the Building administrators, uh, staff are the are the pe best people to determine the usage of cameras. However, I think there is a certain amount of sensitivity to the subject, and I, as a board member, would like to know um, what is um, you know what the distribution of cameras are when we install new cameras. Um, you know if you know um, if we take a different approach to that, and. Um, I would like to understand, I would like there to be a mechanism to make sure that we are updated on that when that happens. Because I think it's in, important because this is, it, it's again, it's a community, uh, community values thing. And that's, that's what we should be doing here on the board is being a representative community there. Because of sensitivity, um, I would like to know and understand when we operate video equipment. It sounds like you're requesting that it be an agenda item, and we have a presentation on it. Well, I would like to, <laughs> well, no. Why, that's why I'm hearing you no, say oh, that. Not. Well, that's not what I'm saying. Oh, okay. uh, by putting something in policy, then make sure that it happens, <laughs> rather than, oh, every couple of years, but, you know, once in a while we have a, uh, once in a while we have a presentation about it. But just, so that, just to see that the board is informed. Does anybody else have any thoughts about that, if we want to proceed, if we have any thoughts we want to proceed with changing the policy or, or, um, um, concerns related to the it should be agenda for discussion to go to policy. That's what that was. Well, I understand. Point. I understand, but I want to find out if somebody else is anybody is interested. So in even though it's not agenda, it's okay. I want to. Yes, I want to. We're talking about policy. You brought it up in the report, and I want to see if anybody else is interested in sending this to policy committee. Right. So does anybody else have any thoughts or about revising policy, or is everybody happy with where it is? Where it is. Two. Um, what we need to do, again, this is a report, so you don't have a discussion on a committee report. Um, of what course we I, do. Uh, and we always do have discussion on committee reports. Okay, then probably not appropriate. But the, the point is, we, if this board wants to discuss this policy, we want to do that. We want that input from the board. So if you want to ask if they want it agendized, and then they can provide the suggestions I, to us ahead of time. That's very helpful. Um, hang on a second, Susan. I am asking other board members to provide. You asked if we, you just asked if we want as to send it to the policy committee. I am asking other board members to point of order that question. In order to discuss this fully, to come to the policy committee, the policy committee would want to know what the board's feeling on this was, which does require a full discussion, not just a, do you want it to go back or do you want it? Because frankly, if it comes back now, I don't know what you want. All right. And so I think if you want this, the correct thing to do would be put this on the next board agenda for a discussion. If you want to have a presentation on where the cameras currently are, how useful the staff feels they are or not, that would be fine. That's up to you guys to decide. Um, but there should be, it should be agendized and there should be a full board discussion of what they want the policy committee to do because the only direction I had were these two things which we chose don't, not don't to Don't tell have. me what should and shouldn't be agendized. We can have a discussion about the issue that I, you brought up. That was up. not my intent. My I'm, intent. All right, Susan, I'm, I'm sorry. point of order requires Susan. a decision. And you're, apparently you're saying my that, point of order you is that are we not can out of order. My point of order is that we can discuss okay, whether we... Okay, I'm going to challenge we, that and have a vote on whether we... If that's what happens with the point of order. I feel unless it is properly agendized in accordance with Wisconsin Open Meeting Law, we should not have a prolonged discussion and, we sh and that it is improper discussion. Okay. So I'm going to ask Susan. for a vote to overrule Okay, chair. just a second. We have uh, well, I'm asking for a vote to overrule I chair. understand what you're asking for. So why for are you it? arguing with me? I get to speak to... Oh, yeah? Okay, go ahead. 
I'm not asking for a long discussion. I am asking just to hear from a couple of board members. So we're going to have a vote. I have, I have ruled that it is appropriate for me to hear from a couple of board members on the issue raised here. We are going to have a vote now on this point of order because you've asked that it be appealed. Correct. You've asked that it be appealed whether or not it's appropriate for board members to give us a little bit of information, a little bit of discussion on whether or not they can, we could send this back to the policy committee. All right? So the appropriate question is, shall the ruling from the chair be, uh, I'm sorry, be sustained is the appropriate form of the question. Yes means that we will have additional discussion. No means that we will not have any discussion right now. Okay? So all in favor of sustaining the board, the ruling from the chair, you signify by saying aye. What? Voice vote. What? You might as well do a voice vote. Do a roll call vote? Yeah. But yes. we are allowed to have a discussion. On no, you're, it's not discussable. And I don't think the point of order is discussed. Yes. Um, so. It's, it's illegal. <laughs> What's illegal? It isn't. To have a discussion without an agenda, I say that. It's well, that's, agenda, that's the whole point of order question, though, so. So the only thing that's been discussed so far is. is we just vote on the point of order. Can, we just, let's just can we just have a, dis have a brief discussion on this? Let's just vote on the point of order. We have, on the floor. we have discussions about things all the time, and I don't understand why this is suddenly so sensitive that we can't discuss it. All right. We're voting on the order to sustain the ruling of the chair. A vote yes means that we can have a brief discussion, which is all I want to ask, about whether we want the policy to committee to take any additional action on this item. Yes. Roll call vote starting with Jeff. Yes. Yes. No, it should be agendized. No, it should be agendized. No. No. Okay, we will have no more discussion on this. Tonight. Tonight, I, I think you ought to ask that. You can arrange to have it put on the agenda. We can't right. discuss it. You can't make, we just said you can't make that discussion, make that comment out putting it on the agenda. Okay, I'm sorry I made that comment. Yeah, I know. Put it on the agenda of future time. No, we'll you make can't make I can't. Wait till the end of the meeting. I can't hear that discussion because you just voted that we cannot, we can't discuss this anymore. All right, any further from the policy committee? Nope, that's it. Okay. Next meeting is in March, okay. sorry. Community, community engagement? Uh, we had, um, we showed our movies this week, our, our documentary on Sunday, it was awesome. Um, we had a decent crowd, could always be better, 30-ish or so people there, um, so it was good. Uh, the, the law student discussion after was amazing. Yeah. That went incredibly way better than I thought. Um, I was disappointed that there wasn't a teacher administrator at the movie, but I get people get busy. Um, I don't know. I, I learned some things for the next time we do it. Um, so it was good. I got a lot of good feedback. I just want to agree. I thought it was excellent. Thanks for setting it up. It's very well done. Susan? I, I also want to agree. And I, I thought the students who were there, who were on the panel, it, it was an excellent way to be able to highlight things that different people saw. That, that was just a great wrap up. It was really well done. Thank you. Uh, discussion items, policy revisions. Okay, these are all on for a first reading and you, you see a list of them first and then below that are all of the links. Uh, and none of these, I don't know that I think any of these really stand out as, um, I mean, I, um, as things that need to call your attention to them. Most of them were pretty minor changes. Some we kind of thought were clerical changes, but we did them anyway. One, uh, one kind of interesting one that we held off on until we got legal, we got legal advice to check the law was 3120, employment of professional staff, because as we, per, as we know on our board, we just vote with a, generally a majority of who's present is the rule and <coughs> what the practice has been that even if not everybody on the board votes, the majority of, of those heard is, carries. On this particular <coughs> policy, it does have to by law to employ a professional staff, um, a certified staff member has to be a vote by the majority of the full board. Um, which is interesting. That, that was, it was a distinction. It was just interesting to find out that, yes, that in fact is a legal requirement. 
Um, beyond that, I don't think there's anything else that I thought was. So if somebody has a question on one, I can look up what the rationale was. But otherwise, there's not much here that I think should, should raise specific questions. Okay, I would note that uh, policy 744, 7440 is on the list of uh, uh, posted policies, so any discussion regarding the video uh, camera uh, uh, policy is correct. appropriate here. It is there because we reviewed it, so we put it there. I think we used it. Well, I, I, actually, I'm not sure. It shouldn't be there. It is there because... It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If anybody wants to discuss it, discuss it. Oh, there was one small sentence. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So you're right. Yeah. So it's okay. just the wrong time to discuss. Oh, that's the different. It's not the same policy we're talking about. Yeah. Oh, oh, one with oh right. We're talking O one facility okay. security. This is different. Yeah. The, the, the video it's surveillance is seven. 7440.01. Yeah, it's right. 7440. It's, it's part point oh one is a part of 7440. I know it isn't. It's a whole separate policy. It's a separate policy. So this one, the only additional change was that parents visiting district schools shall comply with <coughs> policy 9150, school visitors, and other relevant policies and administrative guidelines. This is a whole separate different policy, so no, it is not. Thank you. I had it up. I'm going to up. Just a question. Yep. Dean? Did you, uh, you were at the, uh, uh, our meeting the other night. Did you get to the policy that we were discussing? No, because our meeting was before that meeting. Oh, I thought you were going to meet. So that. no, we don't okay. meet till the twenty-first of March. So we. Okay, will so you're going to put that on your next agenda. Yep. Yeah, we will, okay. and we'll put it before. When the, does that meet? I, I see. I should have said that. It's in my report. Well, this evening. <laughs> it's the twenty-first, I believe. At nine o'clock. Is that right? Twenty-first at nine. Yeah. Yep. So any other questions? Uh, so otherwise, if you want to read through these, I mean, they are all here. Uh, we won't be voting until next week. And I, I have a question. All right. Why do we have a tobacco policy that not mentioned, Julie? Oh, we could have mentioned that one. What did you say, Joe? Why would we have a tobacco policy and not even mention Julie? Uh, because it's on there in that it says any nicotine product. And so it does cover it. In fact, this policy was just revised make sure that it does cover the green sentence says this policy also prohibits the use of other products containing nicotine including but not limited to nicotine patches and nicotine gum accordingly the board prohibits students from using or possessing tobacco or nicotine in any form on student premises in district vehicles within any indoor facility owned etc 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 and then prior to that I'm sorry prior to that it's uh, it, in the existing policy it already outlawed um, smoking of electronic, vapor, or other substitute or simulated forms of cigarettes, closed <coughs> cigarettes, other lighted smoking devices for burning tobacco. So that's jeweling, that's what that is. Electronic. But you specifically call it nicotine patches and nicotine gum, but not jeweling. Because, no, because, jeweling because right above that in the existing policy, it already addresses the smoking of electronic vapor or other substitute or simulated tobacco items. Look right above the green. I see it. Uh, okay, so that's jeweling. I mean, I don't think it, that's that's just one name of electronic. <coughs> I don't know that they. I don't know enough about it to know that they're all <coughs> called that. I mean, some of them are made to look like actual cigarettes. Is that still jeweling, or is that a specific? We just use the statutory language. Right, we use the statutory language basically, so it does cover all those products. Jewel's a brand name. That's what I thought. <laughs> And I, th I thought it might, does it even refer to those ones that are like uh, flash drives that look like flash drives? Yeah, so it's a different, <coughs> as opposed to the one that looks like a cigarette or something. But it's still, so it's kind of on my phone that way. Turn it off like you can. Okay. Sorry about my phone, I can't. So okay, next is the preliminary Saturday certified staffing. <coughs> okay, um, so again, just say that this was uh, is our preliminary plan, um, and based upon the enrollment projections that you saw in January, when we did the open enrollment, um, when the board acted on open enrollment for next year, is the same thing we used to base our preliminary staffing plan. 
And so you'll see that all there is at this point, K-8 is a little bit of shuffling of grade levels as larger classes move through, but the net um, impact on staffing is, is zero. And then the only recommended uh, addition at this point is with regard to the impact um, with the MG21 expansion. Um, and so at this point, based upon the preliminary you know, applications, enrollment, we're projecting an increase of two full-time teachers uh, for that 6-8 program, as well in our student services area, special education and social worker. Right now, we have one social worker that is shared between Maine High School and MG21. Um, we think that we're short staff as it is, and then with the expansion of MG21, um, we're recommending a full additional position um, and, as well as with the special ed. So we'll come back with this again um, at the next board meeting and ask for approval. It's still, it, this is kind of a roadmap to where we're going. There's always going to be some fluctuations later in the year for part-time positions with, as final schedules are put together. Right now the high school students are going through their course selection and so we'll have an update if there are any adjustments on those you know, partial FTEs for the high school as well at the next meeting. So, uh, but just gives you a little bit of an idea of the roadmap we're going at this point. Dan, uh, MG21, when it reaches its full projected enrollment, how many students will there be? So, a uh, maximum of 50 students for each school, the high school and middle school, so 100 total students. 100 total students, and how many teachers total? So that'd be six full-time teachers, plus whatever we have for support staff, special education, social work, and, and so on. Are they resident ones or on call from another location? Uh, well, with this proposal, we have two full-time student services staff committed to MG21. Right now, they're shared. Okay, questions? All right, um, so the lease planning process. Okay. So there was some additional information um, added uh, today, just uh, some of the things were discussed in the previous presentation, but um, in that planning process, the priority issues, um, and one of the things that should note, you know, to Peter's point about the sustainability, and even though that it was clear that was not you know, explicitly stated in um, one of those guided principles, absolutely has been a very core piece. And we did have an entire meeting dedicated just to talk about sustainability solutions. And the next time the board has an opportunity to visit this, that will be presented to the board as well. Um, that is something we want board feedback on. We made the assumption that the board would support um, exploring those uh, sustainable solutions in some individual conversations I've had with board members, but we haven't really talked about it with an entire board, so we'll make sure we have an opportunity to do that um, at an upcoming meeting. Um, the other thing I think I sent in a memo, but just to remind you, uh, the City of Venona actually has a sustainability committee, and so I've been in regular contact with those committee members as well, and, and I think they're going to be able to provide some support with us when it comes to looking at identifying grant opportunities and so on. Um, you know, for things like solar and, and other opportunities. So that's just something we're excited to continue to explore and uh, um, <coughs> down the process. Uh, is this sustainability for the new school only? Uh, no, we'll look at all schools. Pr primarily for the new school, but we'll look at are there some things that we can do it to existing buildings as well. Have, has the, uh, I, I remember, well, I remember two or three years ago, the city of Monona came and requested that we uh, put panels on the roof of Winnequa for their plan and so forth, and uh, we we turned that down on the basis of uh, it's expensive to mm -hmm. to uh, replace a roof if you already have panels on that. Have you learned that that is not quite the case, and it, and does it make a difference whether we're benefiting? Bene beneficiary of the of the panels as opposed to another entity. Yeah. My understanding is that that has changed. Uh, that thing, uh, solar panels, for instance, now um, have become more affordable and there are large, more grant opportunities than there may have been in the past. So that is definitely something we're exploring again. Um, you know, clearly no decision has been made, but I want to make sure that we are 
commitment or goal is to explore every possible option so we can present those to the board you know, for consideration. So including solar at existing buildings. Okay. Um, Dan, um, on the added administrative content that came in later this afternoon, um, which is very helpful, again, just give me some more dates on some more updates. Um, we have a 228 date for design and construction update mailed out to the email. Yep. Do we have that information? You will get it tomorrow. That's the one Katie referenced earlier. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep, we have an email ready to go to the board. Okay. Um, just what's what's helpful is if we have it, even if it's available to the board the day before, because when it comes out, we get questions about it, and if if you're working all day, you may not see that until later. So whenever that's available in the future, and we're going to put it out um, when it can get to the board, I think that's helpful because we get. Then we get questions about it, and we will have already had a chance to read it. Just okay. Okay. Um, yeah, relative to the sustainability thing, one of the things that I would like to do um, with the facilities planning, with the process itself, is that. Uh, you know, we have this good working relationship with McKinstry, and they, um, uh, they've been working with us for quite some time, and they actually have uh, tools and west means and, of looking at um, uh, projects and buildings that the folks at um, Findorf and EAP, that are beyond the capabilities of the folks at Findorf and EAP UA, for example, they put together models of the building that allow them to calculate what the cost of operations. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's, um, a uh, place for to involve them in the process at, from the beginning when you know not necessarily today but um, when we start getting a little closer down the road uh, the designs and have them look at these uh, things because they've been so good about looking at us at what we do from an operating point of view both you know energy energy efficiency energy usage plus other things and operations and man man uh, maintenance that save us a lot of money and I think I think that there's an opportunity there for a, that they could save us money down the road if we have another set of eyes on this. Um, uh, people who really have uh, experience in this area. Susan? I totally agree. I have the same suggestion like a week ago. Um, just when I heard they were talking about that kind of thing. <laughs> and you were on the original committee mm -hmm. that involved them. They, they know what we've done in certain buildings, maybe they're not as updated as, as, as current, but we know they have the expertise and they, based on their annual reporting, they, they were continuing to show that we did some good things back then. Um, I, again, they know what we've done in those buildings, so they have, I, I would say it would be very helpful to have them at least involved at some level rather than having Fendorf and EAU to go back and start from scratch and learn what we've already done. You know, I mean, I think it's, I, I agree. Anybody else have any thoughts? You asking? Yes. I, I, I think we've had a little good long-term, I'd like to know more about it, but I think it would be a good, a good step, step forward too. Um, yeah, well, then I've had a question about how are we, whether we're still getting reports because I'm not sure where we are with our relationship with them. But I, I guess it would it would also be worth knowing what the additional what additional costs or how that would work, whether we're budgeted for that in this process or whether we want to. Or I, you know, but I yeah I don't I don't see a downside to it if there's a way for it to fit in logically. I don't know. Um, it, it, if they do everything right, it may not save us any money, but. Um, is if you make a mistake, there's a potential that over the years it could, there's a the potential savings over the years. So I think it's something to consider. And I hate, yes, adding additional costs. Right now, I don't think we have any uh, uh, ongoing energy. Do we, they're doing any monitoring yet? Um, they submit us an annual verification as long as we have that bond out, but it's just a paper form. Okay, that's okay. okay and it goes in our pu uh, budget, pu budget publication that goes into the newspaper. Right. 
are they still on tap with continuing work with us? So we don't have an active um, contract with them. They do provide an annual analysis of our <coughs> utilities costs because we did do the um, revenue exemption, and then we published that in the newspaper. So they maintain contact. Yeah. And yep, and we have and we have conversations with them, and they obviously are aware of where we're at in the process. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we continue to have conversations on what they can participate and how that looks like. We're getting closer to having a better understanding of what that looks like, especially now that UA and the visionary team has done their work. Mm -hmm. And where does that look like? And we're having those conversations about sustainability um, and, you know, lead certification and geothermal. Um, so and that, that's where we're getting to that point where it'd be. Well, and that was going to be part of my question. If we're, if we're already getting that kind of service from Fendor from the UA, do we feel it would add enough? I, that's, that's the other question. And, and Jared and I have had that like conversation had that. and we'll continue. And, and that's exactly, I mean, we, we have the exact same feeling as, as Express. We're considering that. Uh, right now, we're looking at what can we learn from the, both EUA and Findorf have sustainability um, experts on their staff. They've, we've had one initial meeting with them. We'll have another one next week. And in fact, I have invited um, the members from the Minoan Sustainability Committee to join us at that meeting as well. Um, and so we're in that evaluation process. So before we make any commitments, there'll be a board discussion. Anything else on the facilities planning process? Okay, future meetings. Susan? Um, I would like to make a request for an agenda item under Board Policy 0166, which allows individual board members to uh, basically request items, include items on the agenda. Upon the concurrence of the board president, I'm requesting inclusion of uh, Board Policy 7440.01. Discussion. Sorry, you're requesting which policy? What's seven four four zero point zero one. Camera. This camera. This oh, camera. Is out there. Thank you. Anybody else interested in that? Interested in we have a discussion about the, the surveillance, the policy re regarding <laughs> surveillance. I'm sorry, the policy doesn't provide for that. The policy provides for concurrence of the board president. And, so it's up to you. And before I concur, I want to know how other board members think about what the other board members think about that. That isn't in the policy. I it doesn't matter. I can certainly yeah. ask it. Yeah. Jeff? I would like a discussion because I'm the one that put the revisions in, and they were both shut down, not anywhere near the intent behind the revisions. So uh -huh. that's why I was frustrated earlier, because the only thing that was said was incorrect data about the policy. Um, I think it's important that we do talk to people, and, I, and it had nothing to do with superintendents, principals. It has to do with how do we treat our children in our schools, and I think with Sarah showing up tonight shows that the kids want to have a voice in what they do. So I think it's also important to talk to students about how they feel about cameras everywhere they look. So, the thing you had, Hannah? I, I would, I would say, I would say, uh, uh, request by board members to discuss a policy ought to be. Honored, unless there's some reason not to. Well, I I want to know if there's in, I want to know if there's more than that. There's a general interest, um, so we don't build up the agenda with something that one person is interested in. And and yes, it's a concurrence of the board president, but I'm certainly allowed to seek input to understand the concurrence. And so I'm asking is and I'm just asking is there interest in that we discuss seven four four zero point zero one? I think the answer is yes. And I've got one yes. Anybody else? Well, Susan yes, asked for it, so that's two. That's two. That's right. Anybody else? And Dean, three. Okay. Thank you. I've had, I've just discovered an interest now. criteria. <laughs> 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 Thank you. That's all. That's all. I just want to know what people feel. Um, I mean, for example, if just one person brought, Jeff brought this, raised this issue. If Jeff, Jeff was the only and nobody else, every else thought it was adequate, I'm not sure it's worth the board spending time on it. Absolutely. Um, uh, anything else for you? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so for <coughs> people who are on Facebook today, there's a discussion about um, a bus incident, and which is fine, and I don't want to get into this. But it seems to me like a community meeting, listening session about the buses with Nelson and us there would go a long way. I think it's because everybody started popping in with their story, and I think 
I think a lot of people want to be heard and maybe don't felt, haven't felt heard, and maybe Nelson should be there to listen, and we can address some issues and just let some people vent and just let it be. But a simple, a, a community listening session about our busing, I think, would be a good, good idea. And if you feel like that, then I'll hold on myself. So. That's my, that's a teacher. And, and your concern is? The There's a lot of people that have had problems on the bus, which I get it. I mean, every, I rode the bus back when we didn't have to pay for a bus, but there's problems on the bus, I get it. Bus drivers aren't teachers, I get that. But I think people have problems that need to be heard. <coughs> Susan? Um, there's also been, you know, pretty individual feedback, but um, feedback on the bus not being here to pick up the kids for an event when it's supposed to be here. And I, I don't know anything about the accuracy of that information, but I think there was a recent field trip. <coughs> um, the bus, Jared, do you know? You didn't hear anything about that? No. Nope. Okay, so they just call us. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Could you call Jared first? <laughs> well, this, I guess my concern is if, if there are concerns, and, may, and I'm not saying there shouldn't be some kind of meeting, but I, how do, how do we communicate? I mean, we communicate, I know, in the newsletters that we get there, because I, I see it. I think it's in the newsletters somewhere. I know I've seen it somewhere. What parents should do if they have a concern and what the process is. But are you hearing things back, or I mean, are you hearing enough concerns that there should be? Uh, Some kind of meeting. I mean, I'm just curious because because there is a format right now for if people have concerns for them to follow them through by calling Nelsons and then I think calling you if they don't have, feel satisfied. And I've, I'm just wondering what what more there, we should. I mean, there's if a there's process. If there's a concern about their child right. and behavior and so on, you call the principal just like anything else. If they're concerned about the about the route and being on time right. and so on, call Nelsons. And so I guess I'd ask you if you're hearing these concerns, please remind people to call. Right. And we will absolutely follow up. Right. If no one's not sure who to call, tell them to call me and I'll get them to the right person. Yes, you know. So if a bus, let's say kids are going on a field trip and they're standing out there waiting for the bus to take them on the field trip and it isn't there, the teacher should call. Well, you the teacher should talk to their principal. principal. Well, the principal I just said that, and that's what I told them. That they should okay. call the principal. They should follow up. Okay. But I think I'll a lot think of people... it requires people, a meeting, is what I'm saying. Yeah, it's yeah. not that. I mean, it, we all know. A lot of people don't do that. They just... Mm -hmm. Well, deal, deal with their own thing. Like I've, I've heard numerous people say, you know what, forget it. I didn't call anybody. I just bring my kid to school now. I paid 75 bucks or whatever crazy mommy charge. Well, how, how is something school. supposed to be done about that? We can't go by right. social media where people tend to, you know, I just want to have talking a, and talking and talking. If there's a process to call the principal, that's what we have. A, we have a goal, though, to be more transparent. And as a chair of community engagement committee, I would think that a just a community listening session. But you're basing this off of Facebook posts. Well, I'm basing it on Facebook posts, but also people that have contacted me, for sure. Yeah. And when they contact you, do you ask them to call their principals? Yes, but I also part of the reason I voted for Nelson's was to take it out of our hands, to, that we don't have a, a perpetual well, the behavior flood of calls. Well, never out of our hands. Right. <laughs> but, but I, I mean, the really, I didn't want Jared but bogged down in the stupid buses and let him do other things. I mean, I had, I had a, I had a problem down with, with the bus just the other day, mm -hmm. and I called. It was easy. Mm -hmm. well, that. Not everybody... Is not capable. Not everybody decides to do that. So I just, if you guys don't want to have it, that's fine. No, no, I'm, I'm I'll just saying, on my own. I just want to be As weary of, uh, be careful that we're not making the decisions on social media. No, I'm not, yeah, no, well, I mean. No, but it is, a, it is a source of information. Right. You know, when you have 40 comments, people saying, oh, the, you know, yeah. it, there's behavior issues on the buses that aren't being handled well. And I don't think a community listening session is going to hurt us. It will only help I, us. I would support that. In terms of yeah, sure. transparency and engagement with the community. So. Anybody else has thoughts? Motion to adjourn. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries.